Welcome everyone. I'm Sylvia Lee and I want to welcome you to the Diatom Web Academy brought to you by the Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee of the Society for Freshwater Science and diatoms.org. You can check out the news page on diatoms.org for the schedule of webinar speakers and follow us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. If you would like to be a speaker on the Web Academy or would like to nominate a speaker, please let us know. Our next webinar is Tuesday, June the 22nd at the same time. Um, the webinar speaker is Javier Benito and his title of his webinar is, is Everything Everywhere Diatom Community Ecology Meets Biogeography. And I just wanted to give a shout out to my Lakeside Lab Diatom students who are joining the Web Academy as part, part of their class today. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Sylvia. And I am delighted today to um, introduce Dr. Elena Jovanoska. She is another one of the Macedonian dynamos, super scientists. She has a doctorate from Justice Liebig University in Gießen, Germany. And she's currently a research associate at Secklenburg Museum in Frankfurt. Um, Elena goes by Etsy and um, she has a really amazing background um, and experience in diatom evolution, paleontology and taxonomy. She's um, a member of the editorial review board of the uh, diatoms.org website where she edits the Diplonis group. And um, she's, um, has she also had a Fulbright fellowship in which she came to Colorado and worked at the University of Colorado in Boulder with me and my colleagues. Etsy is also author of the 2020 volume on Diplonis um, in Europe. Um, a lot of the material is from North America as well as from Macedonia. And so she will talk to us today about the genus Diplonis. So welcome Etsy and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sarah, for the nice introduction and thank you for joining the today webinar uh, in which I will talk about the genus Diplonis. So a uh, major evolutionary transition between different habitat types uh, are seen across the tree of life. Transition between uh, water and land, uh, fresh water and marine, all require major uh, behavior, um, uh, morphological and physiological changes to allow species to move into niches not previously occupied. So high frequency of this transition occurred in many groups of uh, organisms, including uh, diatoms. So far, there are uh, a few diatom genera that uh, have representatives in both marine and freshwater environment. Those are, for example, uh, Suridella, Amphora, uh, Campylodiscus, uh, and also Diplonis. So from what we know now, um, Diplonese has about 500 marine species and about 200 freshwater species, which uh, the highest diversity is largely accumulated or concentrated in the ancient lakes or so-called longleaf lakes. So for example, in Lake Baikals, there have been recorded around 17 species. In Lake Hovsko, about 25 species. In Lake Okrit, about 20 species. And only three species from Lake Tanganyika so far. But besides the ancient lakes, um, records of Diplonese have been um, registered in most parts of, uh, of the world. They typically inhabit uh, standing waters at low and at, at high altitude environments, uh, including rivers, lakes, uh, uh, post-glacial uh, lakes, um, uh, various ponds, um, springs, streams uh, of different sizes. 
Uh, and in all these freshwater ecosystems, the members of the genus Diplonase live solitary and uh, as solitary and motile cells in the fine uh, sediments of the benthos as epipelic or epipsamic. Um, but uh, and but when they, but they are not really uh, frequent when they are found. Usually, when we found them, they are really low in abundance and typically coexist with species from different genera, such as uh, such as uh, Anumastus, uh, Amphora, uh, Cam Surella, Campylodiscus, uh, Cymbopleura, Navicula, basically different groups of Naviculoid diatoms. The species has two, uh, two plastids, uh, one on each side of the axial plane, each consisting one pyranoid. But uh, the valves, uh, the frustules of the diplonase actually are quite heavily silicified. Uh, and their valves can be linear, elliptical, or pantheriform in, uh, in shape. And most of them, usually all of them have uh, broadly rounded apices. Uh, the valves are among the um, most complex in the, in the rock with the diatom containing complex chambers through which the cell communicate with the, with the environment. Um, so uh, this uh, system of uh, complex chambers can be divided in two parts. Uh, and uh, the one part is the longitudinal canal and the other part is the, it's, or actually is the marginal part. Um, so the longitudinal, uh, the marginal part, which is actually called a marginal chamber or also alveoli. Uh, the longitudinal canal opens to the interior, exterior through uh, different number, like with various number, uniseriate or multi or multi uh, multiseriate areoli, uh, which are usually covered with cribra occlusions. Um, in some species, uh, these uh, uh, some species have the tendency actually to enlarge the number of areola around the central area, while the marginal chambers they are also as in the canal uh, composed of one or multiple areoli, which are aligned into a transapical uh, line forming the stria, which can be uniseriate or multiseriate. Um, and um, uh, depending on the, um, yeah, uniseriate, sorry, uniseriate or multiseriate, and, uh, but the uh, opposite to the very, complex exterior that, that these species have, the interior is uh, fairly uniform. So uh, the, the canal is um, enclosed uh, by a thick siliquous plate that varies uh, in width and has no opening to the interior of the cell. Uh, and if you look at the more closer on the longitudinal, the, the closer look on the longitudinal canal, we can see that actually the canal is pretty much fairly close from the interior and it looks like a chamber with the shape of a tube inside the valve positioned between the two valves of the cell. Uh, actually the canal uh, is the only, uh, the canal communicates only through the alveoli to the, with the valve interior. Um, there are hypotheses uh, postulated about what uh, what is inside the longitudinal canal. Uh, and some suggest that, that uh, probably uh, the canal is occupied by um, mitochondria and vesicles that generate energy to, for effective movement of the cell and stability of the silicon. Um, here we can more even more closer see that the canal is uh, completely closed from uh, the inside and the connection with the uh, with the alveoli and uh, com and that uh, communicates or opens to the exterior only to the small uh, uh, small areola that are covered actually with cribra in this case the external openings of the chambers are also uh, inside enclosed by a very thin layer that uh, has different perfor per perforations can they can vary in size and through which they will really basically uh, exchange material with the cell uh, interior 
So um, if you look at the closer view or even in on a broken valve or a broken cell uh, that uh, where the a thin silica layer is actually damaged or destroyed. We can see the structure of the alveolus and also the, uh, 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 the openings or basically the areoli, which are uh, externally covered with the uh, cribra. Uh, so um, they are quite uh, a big morphology. There is quite a big or wide morphological diversity. Uh, in the external or the external openings of the marginal chambers, and they vary among the species. They can uh, open through one or several areola, which can be externally open through, uh, through uh, different uh, structures. So basically can be opened with small slit-like openings or longitudinal lines can be, the, they can also be uh, open through a transapically elongated slit-like opening, or they can have a silica cover that has small perforation and it's a bit lowered uh, or uh, depressed below the remaining part of the valve surface. Also uh, the marginal chambers or the alveoli can be covered with uh, Cribra, which can be more simple or more complex, or can be also covered by vola or uh, small pores, which can have a different orientation uh, around the marginal chamber. So from all of these, basically the cribra, uh, the more simple cribra, the one that is on the upper lower uh, uh, right part, uh, they um, they have they can they can be very complex in structure because uh, often in many species they have the tens the tendency to enlarge their cribra and to scatter their pores around the transapical ribs and in this area especially around the cribra a thin healing areas can occur that um, split the enlarged cribra into uh, two or more. Um, smaller occlusions, uh, which are which actually do not correspond with the number of areola. Uh, but in some species, on the, other, on the other hand, in some species, uh, these divisions are more visible, more clearly defined and distinguishable and often in altering position. Uh, and uh, those are basically, those basically represent the real or the true areola. So basically to see the number of areola, it's not uh, only, it's, it's very difficult to use only the valve exterior. They have, uh, the valve interior, it, it, but the rear valve interior is also mandatory to see basically the structure, the number of areola within the alveolus. Um, therefore, like, but if we see the internal structure, of, uh, of, uh, of the alveolus. We can see that this uh, group that has more like slit-like openings, like lines, they have a thick silica bars that are protruding from the transapical ribs through which the alveolus open through the interior. For these groups uh, specifically, we don't have an ECM and we don't know how it really looks like, but uh, the cribrat ones, they internally open through uh, a single elongate opening um, uh, and together with the ones that have uh, a single pores or small pores, it's also uh, can also be a single uh, single opening, but the ones in Vola, especially the Vola structure, half of this, uh, half of the alveoli is covered by uh, thick uh, healing uh, plate. So um, there's also a wide variety which have been seen uh, detected in the in the morpho like morphological variation is also observed in the uh, distal rough uh, endings, which externally they can be hooked into a question mark shape, or they can be simply bent uh, into a short terminal features or uh, they can end very simple at a short distance from the, from the valve mantle. If you look at inside, uh, there's, 
there is not a, a very wide variety or there is not large variety in the termination of the distal rough uh, endings. They are actually, they actually terminate very simple and they're only slightly eleva elevated in the margin. So um, based on this, based on all this complexity and all the variety that I showed, um, main diagnostic characters that uh, are used for identifying the species or delineating species within the genus Diplonase are the shape of the distal rough ends, um, the shape and the size of the central area, the shape of the proximal rough ends, the structure of the stria, and the width and the shape of the longitudinal canal. But uh, as I mentioned before, the interior of these groups of, of diatoms is, per, is, is fairly uniform. So there is not much variety. And the two, and there are two main basically characters that can be used for delineating species within the genus. Uh, those are those are the the stria, the type of stria, or the opening of the stria, the width and the length of the opening, and also the width and the shape of the longitudinal canal. So uh, after observing this really high morphological diversity, one could ask uh, what this intergeneric diversity means. What uh, what what does it tell us uh, about uh, um, the subgenera? So um, should we maintain the, the genus in, in its sexual circumscription or should we split it into smaller genera? For example, Hustad in 1935, even back then, he split the genus into 10 divisions and two subdivisions. Uh, and later on, Drop uh, suggested uh, separating the 10th uh, division of Hustedt key, which includes Diplonese Jungta, into a different genus along uh, the genus Diplonese. Uh, Round et al. also suggested that maybe this natural group can be divided into several or multiple smaller uh, smaller genera. And not long ago, basically earlier this year, Lange Bertalot et al. Uh, divided the genus into three subgenera. So uh, the reason for dividing into the subgenera level, not to a genus level or general level, was basically uh, because of the uncertainty, uncertainties whether the longitudinal canal uh, is a strong uh, morphological synapomorphy that will keep the whole group together, but they certainly acknowledge the striking morphological um, diversity or differences in, in the genus by subdividing it into, into three, uh, three subgenera. Uh, so those are basically Diplonese supervalis, uh, Cribra diplonase uh, subgenus and uh, Vola diplonase, oops, sorry, sorry, Vola diplonase uh, subgenus. The diplonase subgenus uh, includes the forms that uh, have more like slit like openings from the exterior. Uh, and uh, from the inside, as I showed you before, in this group, they are like uh, the, they are only open through a thick bars that are protruding from the uh, uh, transapical ribs. The, uh, kind of the, the distal rough index in this group, almost in all species, are hooked uh, and form a question mark shape. And in this, uh, but in, in this group are basically, uh, are, are included mostly species from the marine and freshwater with only very few, uh, marine and brackish with only very few freshwater lineages. While in the Cribra diplonase subgenus are included all the species that have uh, cribral occlusions from the uh, exterior in both the longitudinal canal and the marginal chambers, or basically the alveoli. Uh, the alveoli open internally in the whole group through a single elongate opening that. Uh, uh, single elongate opening and the distal rough endings are actually. Uh, um, 
slightly slightly bent and terminate into a sh like short term feature feature in this group are included almost all freshwater species so basically 90% of the freshwater belong into the cribra diplone subgenus while the vola diplone subgenus is is much more much smaller uh, and it includes uh, the uh, species that have bullet occlusions. So, um, yeah, so bullet, yeah, bullet occlusions that are, uh, uh, that have uh, from the inside and outside a simple proximal and distal, uh, and distal endings of the rough. And on the inside, they open through a very simple elongate opening, uh, which half of the alveoli is basically uh, covered by thick uh, hyaline area. So uh, in order to see where, what this sub uh, genera mean, we uh, generated a very, very preliminary phylogenetic tree, which is based only on a single chloroplast marker. Uh, RBCL, and we time calibrated the phylogenetic tree um, using the fossils from uh, published in Nakov et al. 2018. And what we can see that uh, the orange uh, branch, which includes the uh, species that have cribrate occlusions, is monophyletic. Uh, and the, the only one species from the diplonase group is. Uh, is also monophyletic, but of course, uh, there needs to be included more species to have a more accurate interpretation. But anyhow, these two genera separated or split up around 30 million years ago. So, but irrespective of whether these uh, um, groups represent subgenera or they represent uh, uh, some sort of divisions or they are simply one to a group. Uh, uh, as the genus Diplonase, we can see that in the freshwater regions, the, um, the most common uh, groups are the Cribra Diplonase subgenus. So basically uh, the ones that have uh, Cribra occlusions and uh, with very few representatives from the Vola Diplonase uh, uh, subgenus. And we have noticed that uh, uh, that uh, many people actually have problems in identifying uh, the species within, the, mostly within the Cribra diplonase uh, subgenus. And often species have been misidentified and then either lumped together or separate into different uh, species. For example, the most typical uh, is diplonase of Alice, which is the most common species that have been misinterpreted in the past. Many authors changed the concept of this taxon in their uh, comprehensive work uh, uh, on diatoms. And this really started uh, when Cliff transferred Hills' taxon from Pinovaria to Diplonese and that inflated concept continue with Hustedt 1930, I think, and 1937, and later Foget in 1977 identified several species are the same uh, under the same name. And this trend continued uh, recently until uh, really until Lange Bertalot and, and Reihardt in 2000 observed the type material and showed that the Diplonase of virus is actually a very different large cell taxon with a different structural pattern. So the valves in uh, Diplonase of valis are very broadly elliptical. Um, they have a uh, they have a lanceolate uh, uh, axial area and very large central uh, area. The uniseriate uh, stria the their un the stria uniseriate and radiate. Um, and if we look uh, at the ACM, we, we can see that actually this group uh, belongs to the Cribra diplonase, uh, which basically shows from the external openings of the, of the aroli that have uh, Cribra occlusions and externally they open through a single elongate uh, opening. This species apparently is very rare in, uh, in Europe, including the Alps and uh, also North America. Uh, it inhabits a habitat uh, with acidophilic and oligotrophic uh, 
diatom assemblages, but also they have been a wide amplitude of water conditions proposed that include alkaline and also brackish waters. So these are rather doubtful because uh, doubtful and probably result, it probably is due to the misidentification. So that false actually diplonase of valis, which occur more frequently, was described as diplonase crameri by Lange Bertalot at Rehard in 2000, which by combination of characters, as you have seen before, uh, clearly even on a coarsely inspiration differ from, uh, can be easily separated and differ from the diplonase of val the real diplonase of valis. Diplonase Karamiri has elliptical uh, valves with rounded apices. The longitudinal canals are narrow. The central area is round to oval. The stria are uniseriate and they are radiate. Uh, also, this species belongs into the Cribra diplonase subgenus. Uh, we can see on the scanning electron microscope that the alveoli open to the exterior through the uh, Cribra with cribrate occlusions, um, that uh, the, um, the canal is composed of B-series stria around in the central area that coalescence into one towards the valve apices. Um, this species um, also, be, uh, so it's widely distributed uh, and it's, uh, it's typically inhabit uh, oligo to mesotrophic, usually calcium bicarbonate uh, rich habitats. Uh, and not long ago, Diplonese uh, muellerio, basically this year, Horst and Lange, Bertal, uh, uh, Horst Lang, uh, Lange Bertalot and Furman described uh, uh, this species, which has valves that are more elliptical with obtusely rounded ends. The central area is fairly large and elliptical. Uh, the stria are uniseriate and a little bit uh, and, and slightly radiate. Um, and you can see that very nicely on the scanning electron microscope photography uh, that uh, this species also belongs in the Cribra diplonase, uh, in the Cribra diplonase uh, subgenus. This species can easily be confused with Diplonase ovalis and Diplonase crameri. Uh, Diplonase ovalis, as we saw before, has very broad, broad, uh, broadly elliptical valves and a uh, higher stri and areola density, while Diplonase crameri uh, has more elliptical valves at much smaller central area. So. Uh, before, uh, when describing Diplonese Muel and Hawaii, uh, Lange Bertalot and Furman mentioned that uh, this species has mostly been looped or identified as Diplonese Crameri in the past. And uh, so this species usually occurs in oligotrophic or dystrophic, uh, slightly acidic with low mineral condition uh, waters. Um, and the other very often confused taxon is Diplonase elliptica. After observing the type, uh, um, uh, the type material, uh, the illustration for the real Diplonase elliptica uh, shows that the valves are uh, rhomb rhombic, uh, have rhombic or elliptical valves with the round central area, the stria uniseria. But what is most characteristic for this uh, species is that the, as you can see here on the scanning electron microscope, uh, that the areola have a very blocky, large, uh, large and very distinct areola. Uh, though often can, can be confused or is confused with the uh, Diplonese crameri, if, you, if, if they coexist in the same place or they're found in the same place, it's, it can be difficult to identify them. So basically the key feature by which uh, you, you can distinguish the two species are the larger number of uh, stri and areola uh, density. Uh, Diplonese pseudovalis has a linear elliptical valve with slightly convex margins and round ends. The central area is moderately large, and what is most characteristic for this species is that uh, it has a B-series stria pattern, 
although uh, on the ECM picture, the the stri or the valve is actually quite corroded. Uh, this species has cribrate occlusions uh, and also belongs to the cribra diplone subgenus. Uh, what is very interesting for this one is that it has been very often recorded in many locations. But according to Lange Bertalot uh, uh, et al. in 2000, uh, 2021, uh, he, uh, this species should not occur in fresh water, in assemblages of fresh water habitat. So, but the reader, these species prefer more saline environment. Another very similar to Diplonis pseudovalis that have been confused also before is uh, Diplonis supervalis. It differs from the previous one by much, much, uh, much more elliptical valves and a larger central area. And these species, uh, after detailed examinations by several research have, these researchers have not uh, been identified or found in the Euro-Asian or the North America, although there are some records in the Holo Arctic region. Diplonis parma is also um, a very often misidentified species. Many supposed records have turned out to be misidentification. So these species uh, have uh, has uh, broadly elliptical valves with obtusely rounded ends. The central is narrow elliptical to moderately round elliptical. Uh, the canals are lanceolate. But what is most important for these species is that uh, the stria is uniserate becoming biserious towards the valve margins. And this can be seen in the lectotypification given by Dei and Kobayashi, um, that towards the, towards the margins, the, uh, the stria becomes, uh, becomes biserate. Um, uh, this taxon had a little bit uh, Problem. Uh, it has a little bit of problematic history because in Hughes, that in 1937 depicted two different shapes for Diplonis parma, an elliptical and an elongated elliptical. And since then, many misidentification or confusions in identifying the species occurred. But after observing the lectotype by Dei and Kobayashi, they, uh, they stated that. Uh, uh, elliptical or more linear elliptical form was not found in the type material. So the, according to them, the true Diplonese Parma should only be a broadly elliptical, uh, to, should have broadly elliptically coarse form. Uh, this species typically occurs in, uh, in eutrophic to oligosaprobic uh, artificial uh, lakes typically. Um, and these are two species which I also need to admit have problems in identifying. Both species have um, rather elliptical forms. They should differ uh, in the striate density and in the shape of the central area. According to, to the uh, original description, uh, Diplonese separanda should have be, uh, between 18 and 21 microns. Uh, uh, stride in 10 microns, where is in Diplonis Pontanella 16 to 18 in 10 microns. Uh, separanda usually, uh, the central area should uh, be smaller in Separanda and a bit larger in Pontanella. And uh, these two species uh, occur in a completely different ecological condition. So Diplonis Separanda should occur more calcium bicarbonate rich uh, oligosaprobic habitats where fontanelle and more spring associated so acido tolerant uh, uh, species. But when we were working on the Diplonese flora from North America, with Zlatko, we found that there were a lot of um, overlaps in characters or uh, in these two species. So uh, we had a little bit of problems in, in placing these species based on the on the original descriptions and therefore we used the central area for separating or delineating these two species. But I, I actually I'm also uncertain what uh, uh, what these two little creatures are and how they can be separated. So, and another or the last one that it, it has been shown to be a little bit more problematic for identification is Diplonese margina striata. 
uh, this species belongs in the Vola uh, diplonase, uh, in the Vola diplonase subgenus, uh, and um, and it has very uh, more or less linear. Uh, elliptical to linear margins the canal is uh, is linear the central area is uh, is uh, is uh, quadratic and uh, can often be misidentified with diplonase oculata and diplonase petersini however from diplonase petersini it differs because uh, this species has uniseriate stria, basically occluded with uh, vola, while Petersini has biseriate stria with uh, small, as basically with small pores. Uh, this species also occurs in calcium carbonate rich oligo to uh, slightly eutrophic uh, habitats. Uh, and I did not mention that when Hustad uh, uh, gave uh, Huge that gave the described these species, it gave these measurements, but after observing the type population, Lange Bertal et al. Uh, provided a, a, a different range for the length, for the width, and the stria density. So basically, the strand density, which uh, it's one of the key characteristics in identifying species from this sub, uh, subgenus. Uh, it, um, yeah, uh, it gave like from 17 and 18, which was before around 20 microns. But while we were working on the diet on flora from Macedonia, we also found uh, uh, a third species that uh, had uh, uh, ranges between Diplonase marginestriata and Diplonase oculata. And we described that as submarginestriata. This species is described and it has only been occurring in Macedonia from Lake Ohrid. No, it's also another location. But uh, anyhow, the most important thing is that um, these species, uh, uh, we, we found these species also in North America when we were working with Sierra on the Diplonase uh, flora from North America. Um, before that species was identified uh, as Diplonase marginestriata, but morphologically uh, it seems to be much more closely related to Diplonase submarginestriata than uh, the real Diplonase marginestriata. Um, and with this, I actually um, uh, want to highlight, or I highlighted some of the uh, taxonomic inconsistencies in the identification in uh, in the identification and uh, describing the species richness of diplonase, meaning that in future we should really try to more accurately identify the diplonase species and discover the species richness not only in the freshwater environments but also in the marine environments. Uh, we should also try to obtain additional molecular information, especially from the groups or species that belong in the uh, Vola diplonase subgenus, and to, so to better understand the evolutionary relationships among the proposed species uh, groups within diplonase, which may support a potential separation of the different genera based on monophyletic groups. Uh, perhaps, in my opinion, uh, the most ideal would be if we can uh, create a morphology-based phylogeny and molecular-based phylogeny and combine them into a super tree, and then a posteriori include uh, some of the fossil species in order to capture more of the diplonase diversity and so to better capture the underlying processes that are generating such a high um, diversity in this group. We should also try to find the sister group of uh, diplonase. I did not mention that before, but uh, diplonase have long been considered to be closely related to the other canal bearing diatom groups. Those are Neidium, um, Scoleoplera, Scoleotropis, Muelleria, and Pargonia. Uh, but uh, if we use uh, on the, the preliminary phylogenetic tree that I showed you before, uh, we can we can see that uh, the canal bearing diatom groups is actually not monophyletic. Uh, it's not, it's not mono, uh, yeah, it's not really, it's not actually monophyletic, although it had been suggested uh, in the past to potentially be. Um, but uh, rather that uh, these species may be um, 
evolved uh, uh, in independently evolved similar trait uh, as a result to adapt to certain environmental uh, conditions or ecological niches uh, potentially as a result of uh, convergent evolution. Therefore, we should uh, provide more efforts or uh, to try to find out the relationship and the sister group of diplonase, which supposedly should live in the marine environments. And this uh, uh, together uh, with the extended phylogeny will give us understanding of uh, not only about uh, potential ongoing convergent processes, which have been largely neglected or overlooked in the past, possibly due to the limitation of genetic data, but could also give us a better understanding about the evolutionary processes uh, underlying uh, driving this high species richness in this group, uh, but also in, in diatoms. But also, but maybe, uh, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. But maybe more importantly, um, this could uh, give us uh, uh, an understanding or, or information, this comprehensive uh, uh, approach could give us uh, an, a better understanding how uh, diplonase and diatoms in general are crossing the salinity barrier and whether this transition are unidirectional or not, uh, and ideally about the drivers uh, controlling this marine freshwater transition, more specifically, whether some certain environmental climate changes or more uh, stochast intrinsic uh, population dynamics control the movements from one habitat uh, into another. And uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, 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 most of the people, I would like to thank the people that directly or indirectly helped me to better understand uh, this supposedly difficult genus. And also I would like to thank uh, the funding agency that provided me support, financial support in this endeavor. And of course, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, please type that in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Itzi. Um, yeah, if, if people do have questions, go ahead and you can type them in the in the chat. And uh, let's see. I think let me see if we can get uh, Matt's already typed one in. I've got a whole bunch too to ask you, but let's see if we can get Matt. Uh, we can we can have Matt. You can unmute yourself and uh, okay, and go ahead and ask the question, Matt. Uh, hello, can you hear yeah, me? We can Hi, hear you. Hi, uh, good talk. Um, I was just curious about, uh, I had to rewrite my question because uh, I was actually curious about, uh, you know, what you said with uh, the potential um, uh, non monophyly of, of diplomacy. Or when you mentioned the subgenera, you said there was a question about uh, the potential synapomorphy of the longitudinal canal. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering if it was because it was shared in other lineages or it wasn't homologous within the genus. Uh, and then you answered it right at the end. Um, but getting back to that non-monophyly of the longitudinal canal, is that just, I mean, is that across genes? You, I know you showed the, uh, the tree, no. just one, one no. gene. Matt, this is really, really extremely preliminary phylogenetic okay. tree. No, seriously, this is extremely just, I just added just to kind of give an idea of what potentially could happen and that maybe the potential scenario because behind that could be the convergent evolution, but this is really far from a, re, uh, uh, a very like a comprehensive study. So no, no, no. Okay. It was just like to give an idea that potentially some convergence or indication for convergent evolution in this group can happen, but uh, definitely more detailed analysis on, data, on these are needed and better calibration and all this other stuff. Okay. More genes and so. All right. Th thanks, Matt. Thanks. Um, I want to just ask a quick follow-up question about that longitudinal canal. Itzi, has anyone ever, <clears throat> have, they, have they got that under the, under the TEM to see what's actually mm -hmm. inside that longitudinal canal? at no, a cellular this, level yeah so this is the this is the thing this is what i also wanted to kind of add but that was yeah um 
I have still not seen any publication on that. So I just based the interpretation on the hypothesis that have been proposed, what potentially could be inside. We started basically growing uh, diplone species when I was going uh, in, in Austin, in Texas, back in 2007 or eight. But, uh, but I don't know, we had a, a, diff, a problems or like there were some challenges on making a TEM for that kind of study. So then we stopped the project, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what's in there. Especially. Yeah, and it, yeah. Was, it was really cool to see what was inside the, you know, the Partecta of, uh, of uh, Mastagloia when they finally got that, when Stormer cut that so many years ago. So um, Ewan's got a question. Why don't you go ahead and ask it, Ewan? All right, sure. Um, this, this talk is perfectly timed for me, as well as the one uh, that Paul Hamilton gave a few weeks ago. <clears throat> I've been writing up Diplinaeus from the Great Lakes, and these uh, images just show up and like, hmm, you know, that's what I have. Uh, the problem is we, you know, with, under the pandemic, we've purchasing literature has been brutal. I haven't received anything in the last year and a half. So I have a kind of esoteric question about this Ovalis and Molinari. I mean, yeah. is the shape really the only thing? Um, I have a feeling that's something we have. Uh, no, well, uh, it's it's not only the shape; it's actually also the the striate density. So this is the this is the real ovalis. This is from the licta type, and this is basically uh, Muellen Haweri. So if here I have compared them, and you can see that the, there, at least to me, there is a clear differences between both of them. Okay. Or no, for you not. <laughs> Yeah, around the central area looks really different. Okay. No, I mean, the central area, actually, Muela and Haweri also has a relatively large in comparison to that group. It has much larger. Muela and Haweri before was loomed or identified, or uh, most so often was identified as Diplonese Krameri. There was not confusion much into Diplonese Ovalis, but mostly into Krameri. And therefore, Horst, and, uh, Horst uh, separated the species and described it as Muela and Haweri. But Diplonese of Valley should be much, much, much more larger. And this yeah. is a really rare taxon that, that really there are only few locations where it occurs, also including North America, which you have it, guys, there for sure. Good. I took a screenshot if that's okay. No, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead. Thanks. Hey, thank, thanks, Ewan. <clears throat> We've got a, a question from. Uh, from Yanni, um, let me see if I can find there. Let me see if you'd like to ask your question. You you may, Yanni. I I, I had the same. I I was I was going to ask the same question. So. Oh really? Uh, okay. Hi. Um. Let me see if I can turn. Hi. My, so you can see me. Hi. Um. So my question was: You talked about the transition from the the marine environment to the freshwater environment, and I was curious: Has there also been any transition? from the freshwater environment back to marine environments? Um, and if so, how would you know if they're, I mean, are they sharing back and forth? Uh, yeah, like uh, Alverson, Alverson and Tal, I don't know exactly which year have shown that, they, they have shown that they go back, they return in the fresh, uh, from freshwater into marine environments. And you can do this based on phylogenetic relationships, basically to see whether some of the, um, the species from marine are more closely related to freshwater and vice versa. There are some special statistical methods that can do that. So you can do that and in diatoms indeed occurs. Wow, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, Itzi, have you, have you, have you, uh, what kind of, what kind of strategies have you had for success in culturing Diplonius? Oh, well, uh, I think that uh, when, we, uh, it's been a while, really, it's been a while that, uh, uh, since I was growing cultures. So uh, back in, again, I will say in 2007, 2008, I think that was quite successful. It was good, like they were going quite fine, but also depends from which locations. We also tried when Elizabeth was coming, for example, in Macedonia to culture some data from Lake Ukrit, and that really badly failed. Uh, also, Alexandra Mykulek is now trying to culture some data from Lake Ukrit, and it's also not working well. 
I think that they just require two specific conditions. But um, but uh, I think that we used some from Texas and a uh, few of them were marine and they were quite happy. They were growing quite well, but uh, unfortunately I needed to leave and the project was, yeah, ultimately needed to be to, to end. So we needed to terminate it. But I think depends, simply depends of the locations and of the, and of the, of the species, whether it requires more specific conditions or not, I guess. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Layla's got her hand raised right now. Could you ask your question, Layla? Yes, thank you very much uh, for, for this talk. Uh, you said that um, uh, Diplonis pseudovalis uh, never um, do not exist in freshwater habitat. Does it mean that uh, Diplonis pseudovalis didn't evolve enough if you uh, if you say that uh, uh, in phylogeny, uh, uh, Diplonais, uh, um, uh, well, uh, <laughs> um, uh, take off salinity. Uh, and uh, uh, I wanted to know uh, for marine uh, species, um, is uh, there one specific uh, taxonomic uh, um, criterion? Uh, I mean, uh, either in the areola or tria or Thank you yeah, I think, yeah, I think that why uh, uh, Lange Bertalot et al. in 2001 suggested that these species, it's not, uh, I mean, they clearly say that, that this is not a freshwater species. The, the thing is that I don't know whether it did not evolve or not uh, in the freshwaters, but uh, apparently there have been a lot of misidentification in the freshwaters. So probably species similar to uh, Diplonis pseudo valis were identified as such, but actually were not the real Diplonis pseudo valis. <clears throat> so this could be one of my explanation why that could be, why they stated in their publication that this species uh, does not belong in assemblages of freshwater habitats. And what criteria, uh, I, I said already the criteria maybe, I'm sorry, I was a little bit tired, so maybe I was not very uh, clear with the talk. Um, so we use uh, from these external, so the main characters really for identifying the species are the shape of the distal uh, rough ends, the stria, the areola, the number of stria, the number of areola, the shape of the central area, the proximal rafts, I, end them, uh, I added them here, but actually they don't vary that much. There are only one or two species that have a very pronounced hooked-like proximal uh, rough ends, but this is not common. So they are usually slightly bent and that's it. And the other criteria is simply the longitudinal canal whether it's wide, whether it's narrow, uh, how much arola has the longitudinal canal. Uh, and these are basically the main characters by which you can distinguish or differentiate species within the genus. If that was the question, I'm sorry, I don't know. No, right. no uh, thank you, but uh, what I wanted to say- oh, sorry. Uh, just for marine species, uh, yeah. for marine species, uh, which uh, criterion, uh, taxonomic criterion uh, that you uh, occur uh, every time? Oh yeah, well, depends of the group. They are, the, for uh, every group, it's very different. So therefore I just explained now for Diplonese because for each group, it's very different. Yeah, in Diplonese, yeah. It's just yeah, so to distinguish, for, for example, in a, a fossil, uh, a sediment yeah. when we try to 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 to, um, uh, to, to see uh, if it was marine or continental uh, how we can uh -huh. yeah this is the problem <laughs> thank you <laughs> ah okay well this uh, this is basically yeah so this uh, i mean it's based on the literature right i mean uh, whether it has been recorded in marine or freshwater depends on the ecological preferences of the species i don't think that a single species occurs in both so this is almost, I, at least I have not seen it or I have not read something on that. So probably it's just like the ecological preferences or the habitats where it has been found to be used as a guideline for 
saying this is marine, this is fresh water, but whether they differ. So usually the scribra like, they also like almost all groups occur also in the marine. So uh, species from the three sub genera according to horse, uh, which have been separated, they, the three of them occur also in the marine habitats. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah, th yeah. Thanks, thanks for that question. I, I was also very interested in that marine, that marine, uh, this marine diversity that's out there as well. And I'm going to ask Tom, who comes to us from the marine world, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question, Tom. Uh, hi, Etsy. I, I really hi, enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> and I, you know, especially looking at you know some of the diversity figures you had for the ancient lakes. And I, and I started comparing those numbers to what we see in the marine, and you know, we also have a pretty, uh, pretty high diversity. And here in the Keys, we have at least thirty different species and forms. Um, and but again, you know, you, you look at stuff and counts. Again, you know, uh, low low relative abundances. So a lot of times yeah. they're ignored because they're difficult mm -hmm. and, and, and low abundance. But I wonder if you could say something about, um, you know, what's uh, like subhabitats do they occur in? Sorry? Are there any subhabitats they're specialized in? Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, you're right. I also was recently collecting samples from the Indian Ocean and indeed the Diplonese species are quite, uh, quite rare. They're not very abundant. But uh, the habitats, I mean, the substrate, as you are saying, is just like they, they really prefer muddy and, uh, and sandy habitats. I mean, substrate, if this is what you're asking me. Yeah, oh, okay, yes, as opposed to uh, epiphytic or, you know. No, epiphytic, no, 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 so. no, no, no. It's a, they're, they're really, they're, they're really largely uh, in the, in the bentos, basically in the muddy and in the sandy habitats, uh, substrates. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's a, um, I have, similar to what Ewan was saying in the, the, the difficulties in getting literature, I, I, was, uh, I was actually unaware of the, the, the new subgenera that had been erected on, within, um, within Diplonius this year. And yeah. I, of course, grew up on the sort of the Hustedian or groupings of, of Diplonius. Do, do, do those new subgenera include both freshwater and eat all include both freshwater and marine representatives within the subgenera? Yes, yes, they do. Yes, okay. yes. So this is this is based on both marine and freshwater. Therefore, maybe I was not clear. I'm sorry about that. That's why I was saying that in the Diplonese subgenus, uh, most of the species that are included are basically marine and fresh, uh, marine and brackish, with only few freshwater lineages. Ah. So usually, from the Diplonese subgenus, there are really only very few uh, freshwater species, and they are mostly, mostly, mostly uh, found in the ancient lakes. They're really outside in the region of flora, very rarely. Wow, that, you know, that, that that's interesting. I'm I'm gonna look look. I, I need to dig up that paper. I haven't seen that one yet. And I want to ask one other question. I have yeah. similar to what Ewan mentioned. I have not had a chance to see the new. We haven't been able to receive the new Diplonius book yet. Is does it include marine taxa or is it no? It's just no, it's fresh strictly water. fresh water. It's That's the whole Arctic. Uh, so there it's like, it's divided on two parts. The first part is uh, um, and for the whole Arctic, the diatom uh, species, the freshwater diatoms in the whole Arctic area and the Diplonis uh, from North America, uh, from North Macedonia. Okay. So it's strictly fresh water. Okay. Well, we're coming up on the top of the hour. Uh, Rob has said, thank you for explaining those taxonomic challenges. I know that uh, Diplonius, since they're so rare that every time you see one, it's sort of one of these things you look at, you stare at, you wanna try to figure it out. And those SEM images that you provided really help to clarify what these, these differences that we can, we can identify um, with these. Um, I want to thank you, Itzi, for, for your presentation today. Yeah, it's thank great. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, You're thank welcome. you. You're welcome. Sorry for being So tired. glad you can do this. And, um, and all of these uh, Diatom Web Academy um, presentations are recorded. And in a, a, a few days or a week, we'll have them up on, the, uh, up on our YouTube channel. You can find those links at the Diatom 
uh, org slash news um, page there. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And especially I want to thank Itzi for, for, for her presentation and, and telling us everything there is to know about Diplinius and all of the, the great challenges that it, it, it gives us. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. All the best. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>